Welcome back. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. In 1964 in Mississippi, fewer than 7% of African Americans were registered to vote. And that was no accident. White Democrats had built an effective machine to keep black residents away from the polls, despite being guaranteed the right to vote in the Constitution nearly 100 years before. To register to vote, African Americans had to pass nearly impossible literacy tests. They had to pay annual poll taxes, which were out of reach for many. And the state disenfranchised those convicted of certain crimes, crimes chosen specifically because they were considered to be those most likely to be committed by African Americans. Civil rights workers had been trying to chip away at this disenfranchisement throughout the early 1960s. They were led by Robert Moses of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a civil rights legend who was actually going to join us here in the studio later this hour. And they met with great resistance. Activists were murdered for their efforts. But slowly, activists were drawing the national spotlight toward Mississippi. Q Freedom Summer. Fifty years ago, when a thousand volunteers, many of them white northern college students, converged on Mississippi to help black voters overcome those obstacles and register to vote. They were largely unsuccessful. Although 17,000 people attempted to register to vote, only 1,600 were actually added to voter rolls. But what Freedom Summer did was to prove a crucial point, that literacy tests and the poll taxes and everything else were not actual standards that could be met that the goal was to prevent African Americans from voting, full stop. And that no matter what you did to circumvent the means to that goal, the goal itself of total black disenfranchisement would remain constant. Freedom Summer proved that you could not give black people a voice in the political process just by teaching them how to pass literacy tests. It proved that you could not play by the rules and win. Instead, you had to change the rules. One year later, Thanks in part to the national spotlight that Freedom Summer showed in Mississippi, thanks to the mountains of evidence generated by those activists trying and failing to register people to vote, Congress passed and President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act abolished literacy tests and other instruments, both subtle and blunt, to suppress the black vote and sent federal officials to register voters and observe elections. It would be difficult to overstate the importance of the VRA and what a civil war and constitutional amendment could not do the VRA did. In 1964, 6.7% of African Americans in Mississippi were registered to vote. Five years later, 66.5% were registered. In addition to abolishing literacy tests, the VRA granted power to the federal government to prevent state and local officials from putting new discriminatory practices into place, a power known as preclearance. Under the VRA, the U.S. Attorney General must approve any changes to election laws in states, counties, and townships that had a history of discrimination and disenfranchisement before those changes can go into effect. Preclearance was key because suing states after they had discriminated just simply didn't work. Before the VRA, the Justice Department had sued states and jurisdictions repeatedly for voting rights violations after the fact, including 30 lawsuits in Mississippi alone between 1961 and 1965, to very little effect. The VRA laid out a formula for determining which places could not be trusted to maintain fair voting laws based on their history. And as of 2013, nine states were covered, including, of course, Mississippi. Those are the states in bright yellow on this map, and as were counties and towns in six more states, shown here in a darker yellow. It is that crucial part of the Voting Rights Act, that formula, that the United States Supreme Court struck down one year ago. The Supreme Court ruled the formula had become unconstitutionally outdated. And without the formula, without a list of jurisdictions that could require preclearance, well, there's no preclearance. But there's a solution. Congress can replace the formula. Who would have guessed that? Nearly an entire year later, Congress has failed to do so. Yeah, everyone would have guessed that. Okay, in that year of inaction, states that were once covered by preclearance have practically clamored over each other to impose voting restrictions. Within hours of the Supreme Court decision, Texas announced it would immediately implement a voter ID law that had been blocked by a federal court. North Carolina enacted a mind-boggling series of restrictions that reduced early voting, eliminated same-day and pre-registration, and added strict voter photo ID requirements. Alabama and Mississippi enacted voter ID laws. Florida has cut back early voting days. Virginia now requires voter ID and has put new limits on voter registration drives. These states joined a tidal wave started in 2010 of mostly Republican state legislatures putting restrictions on the vote. 
That's not to say there hasn't been an effort to plug the dam. A bipartisan, bicameral group of legislators has proposed a new formula which would place states under preclearance if they have had five voting rights violations in the past 15 years. Four states would require preclearance right off the bat. You guessed them. Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. And despite bipartisan support, the bill has not budged, although its sponsors are hoping to break through. Senator Patrick Leahy will hold a full Judiciary Committee hearing on the bill this coming Wednesday. The bill's future remains uncertain. House Speaker John Boehner had been noncommittal at best. Majority Leader Eric Cantor, remember him, he was said to have been working closely behind the scenes to bring the bill up for a vote. But now, Cantor is out. And even if the bill were to pass in its current form, it leaves a gaping hole. Disenfranchisement as the result of voter ID laws would not count as a voting rights violation. Joining me now, two individuals working feverishly to protect and restore voting rights across the country, Judith Brown Dianis, co-director of the Advancement Project, and Dale Ho, director of ACLU's Voting Rights Project. So nice to have you all here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. What? Judith, in this past year, <laughs> this tidal wave, is there any hope that Congress is going to come up with a new formula to stem this tide? Well, I mean, you know, the problem is that the Voting Rights Act really, it served as a deterrent, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what opened the floodgates. And so now we're in this moment where this bipartisan effort has to happen, right? But we have a dysfunctional Congress, right? Yeah, say but that again. But at the same time, <laughs> this is the Voting Rights Act. You know, next year marks the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So I think we're very hopeful. This is the first step, is this hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and look, we have a lot of evidence that voting discrimination still exists, and that's going to be before Congress. And there have been hearings across the country. So we think we're building the record, and we're going to get something So passed. come back to Congress for just one more second before we move on. And that really is about cancer, because my very first thought when I heard about that surprise loss was, okay, there might be lots of reasons ideologically to be pleased for some folks on the left that Eric Cantor will no longer be in the House of Representatives. But I had heard from multiple members of the CBC that Cantor was working That's towards right. getting a new formula. That's right. He, he was. Um, but, you know, that means we'll just have to find somebody else. I mean, there are other Republicans who are stepping up to the plate who have been at the plate for a while. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're just going to have to rely on them. Because, again, this is as American as Apple pie. This is democracy. We're making sure that everyone is equal. And so we think they'll come along. So tell me, Gil, particularly from a, a kind of litigation standpoint, mm -hmm. if we know that preclearance was serving as a deterrent, but for the moment is basically toothless because we can't figure out where preclearance would apply, why can't Section 2 do the work that preclearance did before? You know, I mean, sort of immediately in Texas, the Attorney General came out and said, all right, we got this. We're going to take Texas to court. Is there reason to think that we're in a 61 to 65 moment where the, where the lawsuits won't be effective? Well, you know, we obviously do not have the same kind of tool that we had with preclearance, mm -hmm. but we've been remarkably effective, I think, over the last few years fighting back against these voter suppression mechanisms, right? So not just Section 2, but also state constitutional law challenges. Mm -hmm. So the Advancement mm -hmm. Project and the ACLU joined forces, litigated, knocked out Pennsylvania's voter ID law mm -hmm. under the state constitution. Governor Corbett is not appealing that decision. Mm -hmm. And then we use Section 2 again right. together in Wisconsin to knock out Wisconsin's voter ID law. So we are, I think, pretty successful right now. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you know, Wisconsin, even before that decision came out, you yeah, know, they <laughs> Preclearance. <laughs> well, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely not. But you know, but to your point about the nece necessity of preclearance, everyone who saw that trial knew Wisconsin had no shot. Mm -hmm. They had no evidence of voter fraud, and we had hundreds of thousands of people um, who were going to be disenfranchised by it. So then the legislature started talking about changing the ID law, right? Which is exactly what mm -hmm. places like Mississippi were doing between 1961 and the outcome of an election. We can't wait till the end. Can I, can I just tell you, I, I am moving to North Carolina, from Louisiana, for goodness sake. And we're right? glad. We need yeah, more progressive I, I mean, voters I, in I North am, Carolina. I am thrilled, but I may not get to vote because, <laughs> can I tell you, oh, when I no. went to get my driver's license, the list of things necessary to get my driver's license is, and I am not exaggerating. We will represent you. It, it is more than <laughs> we, what, it's more than what it took <laughs> to get a passport to travel around the world, to drive right. around North Carolina. Right. It was the first time that I felt in a very personal way mm -hmm. 
just how high that barrier is right. because obviously I have all the resources in the world to go find my original birth certificate, my original social security card, my passport, my driver's license from another state. Are judges looking at this and saying, come on, this is not about protecting it's, the vote? Yeah, I, I think they are. I mean, the stories of the people who are impacted is what wins the day, right? In North Carolina, our lead plaintiff is Rosanelle Eaton, 93 years old, someone who was one of the first African Americans to vote, to register to vote in the state of North Carolina in the 1940s. She had to take a literacy test where she had to recite the preamble to the Constitution. She had a cross burned on her front lawn, and here she is again fighting for voting rights. She is someone who will be disenfranchised under this new law in North Carolina. So those are the kinds of cases, because we can't, we have to take it away from the law and get back to regular everyday mm -hmm. Americans that want to have a voice in our democracy. Do you think, given that kind of framing, and I know that, that the politics side is, is less your side, but do you think that uh, Americans, because part of what turns the tide and gets the VRA, is that Americans see Bloody Sunday, Americans see mm -hmm. what happens in Freedom Summer with the death of the civil rights workers, and they just say, you know, this is not us. You know, we might want to win our side, but we're not going to win in this way. Have we started to turn a corner where ordinary Americans of all ideological positions will say, look, we, these kinds of restrictions are just not who we are as a 21st century people? You know, I really hope so, Melissa. You know. Ten years ago, I think when the voter ID issue started um, percolating, I think a lot of people just didn't understand why that would be a problem because a lot of people, most people, have some form of ID. For, so for them, it doesn't seem like a big burden. And I think courts, when they first started hearing about these issues, sort of thought to themselves, well, I, you know, judges who are, you know, pretty privileged people think to themselves, well, I have one of these IDs in my pocket right now. But there's been a really, really, I think, successful education process. The litigation has been really important um, for that to showcase these individuals like Ms. Eaton, who, you know, for them, it actually is a significant burden, and they're a significant portion of the population. I mean, Nevada just just won this among the voters, right? This the the, the turning back of the Nevada um, proposal wasn't a legal fight, right? It was a it was a voter fight. Right. And the thing is that Americans believe in early voting. They believe that voting should be easy. It should not be hard. They believe in free, fair, and accessible elections. And so here you have these legislatures trying to make it harder, and you have no evidence of the thing that it was supposed to be solving yeah. voter fraud. In fact, the president. Election Commission came out with a report saying that fraud really did not exist. All these court cases say there was no reason for this. So we're starting to pull back the cover on mm -hmm. the motivations behind it. Yeah, I mean, it's a solution for a problem that doesn't seem to exist. And when we have um, Tom Tillis, who's running in North Carolina, having said in 2012 something about sort of traditional voters, by which he meant white American voters in North Carolina, sort of losing population to those who are African American Latino, it does feel in those kinds of moments as though it is. Um, as though it was racially motivated. Stick with us. We have more on this because when we talk about legislators who are trying to reduce the vote, it is time to go to Ohio. So stay right there. Up next, the state that may be ground zero in the voting rights battle. We're going to take you away from Mississippi, up the river to Ohio, where an important campaign is underway right now.